Good morning, Facebook. It is 8.18 a.m. It is Tuesday morning, July, June 18th, I believe, right? 17th. You sure? I don't know. 18th, yep. All right. Okay. Wow. Oh, 8.18 on the 18th. So, 18.18. There wow, you go. Wow, man. Um, so, we're excited to be with you this morning and look at the book of First John. If you were with us yesterday, we went and covered through verses 1 through 4. And today, we're going to cover verses... 5 through 10, Lord willing, because there we as go. Dad was talking about, we don't know sometimes how long we want to stay on a verse, um, but we're going to be looking at those verses. So if you have your Bible, I encourage you to flip open to there. It's good that you listen to these with a the Bible opened, because um, sometimes it's good to see the text in front of you. But if not, no worries. Uh, usually Brandy comes on here and she posts the scriptures in the chat. So when she gets on here, um, I'll have her do that uh, for you guys. I see Brandy just came on actually. So Brandy, if you could, uh, we're going to be in 1 John 5, 1 John 1, 5 through 10. So Brandy, if you could post that in the chat, that would be fantabulous. So uh, why don't we just get started and um, we're going to pray and um, I'll give you a little recap of what we talked about last week and then we'll just get right into it. So uh, dad, if you could lead us in prayer, that yeah, would be still... great. Yeah. Lord, we just pray as we start this beautiful day that we just continue to look to your word and just consider just how great you are yes. and how great of a calling we have from heaven to bring your gospel, the light of your word, the light of Christ into the world. And we pray that we would bring it with our actions and with our attitude, with the way that we believe and the way that's reflected in how we behave and show the world the character of Christ in us. And we believe that that's going to happen to the degree that we submit to you, yield to you, rely upon you, and we just destroy that part of us, Lord, that is, is it, um, malevolent, sinful, dark, and we allow the light of Christ to shine on us and bring light to whatever areas might be in the shadow. And so we just pray, Lord, knowing that we are completely dependent upon your Holy Spirit for all of this. We pray that it would become a greater fullness and fulfillment in our lives today in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. All right, looks like people are more people are coming on, so thank you for joining. If you just joined, we're going to be in 1 John chapter 1 verses 5 through 10. But a little recap before we get into it. So last message, which was yesterday, we talked about um the verses 1 through 4, and in those verses John talked about how he was an eyewitness of Christ. We talked about how he starts off the first part of 1 John saying, that which was from the beginning. Basically, he's trying to reinforce the idea that Jesus is no plan B, new concept. He was someone um, with the Father. He was God. He's establishing that Jesus is God. And we talked about how he, Jesus even said, before Abraham was, I am. So he's testifying of his co-eternal nature. Then John talks about um, that we've seen him, we've heard him, we've touched him, we've looked upon him. And what we're saying to you, what I'm saying to you, is from experience, personal experience. And that's important to know because you can trust someone that is an eyewitness. Um, John's not making up some story he, tur he heard. It's not some he heard. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just say that? Yeah. <laughs> potty mouth together repent, yeah. repent after that um but yeah john's talking about <laughs> john's talking about who he experienced and most scholars actually say john was the closest disciple to christ john even refers to himself in the gospel of john as the one who jesus loved and then he says we're writing these things to you um, so that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowships with the father and with the son so the things written give us closer fellowship with the apostles, with our brothers in Christ, and with the Trinity. And then lastly, he says, writing these things to you so our joy, your joy will be full. And we talked about how everything God writes is actually meant to flourish, make our joy flourish. So you can check out the last video. We go more in detail, but let's pick up in verse 5. And I'll just read the whole passage, uh, verse 5 through 10. It says, this is the message we have heard from him. And proclaim to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness. Everybody say, touch your neighbor, 
and say, no darkness. No darkness. <laughs> right? Shout it in your house. No darkness. Right? If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Mm. All right. Put in the comment section, the truth. We're going to get you guys engaged today, this morning, to wake up. Put the truth in the comments, in all caps, so that you remind yourself of the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth, there it is again, is not in us. If we confess our sins, this is an amazing promise right here. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wow. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Mm. Amen. So he starts off and says, this is the message we've heard from him and proclaim to you. Can I just say, yep. when I hear you say that, like, as far as a morning meditation, the first thing that comes to my mind, if I'm, like, writing into my margin, yeah. is what is the message that I'm declaring mm. unto you? Okay. What's the message from, like, you know, there's a theological explanation, and, and I hope you share some of that, but what is the message? Because every one of us has a message we're declaring unto the world. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty, I'm funny, I'm handsome, I'm successful. Um, I'm likable, I'm intelligent and academic, whatever yeah. it is. But what are we declaring that's actually pointing people to Jesus? Yeah, right? yeah. because everyone's sharing a message, um, spoken or unspoken. Uh, people are looking at your life and they're drawing some conclusion about what you're about. Um, you know, before I came to Christ, the message I was proclaiming was... Um, Man, it was probably a lot of different messages I was proclaiming, but um, I'm likable. That was kind of my message. I, I, I love, I'm a, I'm a friendly, outgoing person. That, that's probably the message I was proclaiming. Um, those things are still true about me, but it was from not the motive of leading people to Christ. It was leading people to my social ability. But now my message, hopefully, is um, God's word is eternal. I, I pray that people look at me and see in my life that the Word of God is important because I try to speak the Word in conversation, to point people to Scripture, to point people to God. And I hope that's the message that I'm sharing um, mm -hmm. and that, um, you know, God loves you. I hope that's a message that I'm sharing. So that's a great, Dad, I really like that question. Um, what message are you proclaiming? Yeah, it's it just uh, to add one more thought to it, to like really color it a little more is that um, the, the, the idea of, uh, let me think, the idea of this is, this is the message we have heard and we declare, right? So you can't declare something of God until you have first heard it, received it, believed it by faith, internalized it, and then it comes forth from you. Yeah. Right? So I just think that's really an important part too. This is the message that we have heard. So that's where we get the akua, where we get the word acoustic. Yeah. Well, this is the, this is what we've heard, and now it's to the degree that now John writes it and says, which I think is implied here, and we see in the rest of First John is we did more than just hear it. He's going to talk about right even in the next following verses. Yeah. How he actually applied it, how it's working out in his life, and by the way, that's not enough. Yeah. We also have to be declaring it. That's right. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to interrupt the message, but uh, John. Uh, put in his daughter Kate and son-in-law were in a car accident in Philly um, Both of them were in the hospital. So I just want to take a quick second to pray. Yeah, uh, usually we don't do this even though I sometimes um, There's prayer requests in the chat uh, Just because you know, this is for the uh, the message But we should probably start soon uh, our prayers our prayer evening prayer again Because mm. I know there's a lot of people putting prayer requests in so we're gonna pray for you John, but um you know, if you don't get prayed for, don't feel, um, don't, don't feel yeah upset about that. It's just that when we're doing the message, uh, we're in the zone. And know? we're not and always we miss, able we miss, to read. We miss the comments a lot, to be honest. So, But I do want to take a second to pray for, for Kate. So, Father God, I pray for Kate and the son-in-law. I pray for your healing. Yes, I pray for you to allow them to be protected, released, yes, uh, the wisdom of God upon them. Um, God, do what only you can do. Um, show up strong in Jesus name Jesus name amen all right God bless so yeah you can only proclaim the message that you've heard right 
And this is the message, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Shout it out again, no darkness, right? <laughs> There's no darkness in God. So, you know, when you're, I, I know, Dad, you've used this analogy, right? When you're, you know, in the dark basement, right? I mean, how many of you guys have that that basement where it's just there's kind of like that creepy part of your house or whatever and it's just like oh man I don't like to go in there um, you know when you're in the darkness and, and you want the light to go on do you grab a baseball bat and start swinging it around <laughs> and try to get the darkness out do you start yelling at the darkness <gasps> do you start praying for the darkness to go away no um, do you invite your friend over and, and try to tell you know work together to get the dark no no you turn the light switch on. You just put on light and darkness has to go. And, you know, the truth is, is sometimes when we go through darkness in our lives, um, we try to fight against it. We try to have a friend help us get rid of it. Uh, we try to pray against it. And, and, and those things can be helpful. But the reality is, is one, you just look to God and praying is a way to do that. So, but sometimes... And this is something I, I truly believe. Sometimes we don't need to pray about it. We need to be reminded of truth. I mean, we only should pray. Prayer is so important. But sometimes we ask people for prayer before we actually go to truth. And we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. So our prayers should be in alignment with his word. But sometimes, and, and this is where discernment comes, sometimes it's not... We should always pray, pray without ceasing, right? I'm not saying don't pray, but sometimes um, it's a truth problem. Does that make sense, Dad? Because um, sometimes believers, when they go through hardship, they just call everyone and say, pray for me, pray for right. me. But, you know, sometimes that solution can be solved by, you know, reading the Bible, like right. getting into truth. So would you say we need to spiritually assess the situation yeah. instead of just as, as important as prayer is? Yeah. Instead of being reactive and just quickly calling up everyone saying, pray for me, first we have to really assess, okay, let me just, before I call people, let me just ask, God, what are you teaching me here? Yeah. What's the goal in this? How is Christ being formed in me? And then when you go and you ask people to pray, you actually have direction. Yeah. And you can ask them to be determined to pray in this particular way because you just weren't reacting. You actually were trying to really get the full measure of whatever God was doing in the midst of that. Mm -hmm. And that comes through thinking, mm -hmm. not just not just mindlessly throwing out prayer requests. Yes, because I've, I've found that sometimes what we do is we we just pray. We ask for prayer, but really what we're doing is venting about a problem. And then they're, they're kind of saying, oh, I'm sorry that happened to you. Yeah, I'll pray for you. And you're just kind of venting. And you're both kind of, you know, it's it's not really prayer. It's more complaining and complaining to God <laughs> with someone else and having them, you know. And I think there's some sort yeah. of soothing that comes from the prayer rather than the one to whom we're praying. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Do you yeah. agree? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Um, so um, it's good to ask for prayer, right? But um, are you going to his truth first, right? Are you wrestling with what he said? So, um for example, it says, God is light, and in him is no darkness. So when you're in darkness, turn on the light. Look to the truth of God's word. Uh, it says in John chapter 1 that in him is light. In God is light. So, um, you know, God is the light of the world. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. So the thing is, when it says God is light and in him there's no darkness, this is a reference to Genesis 1 where God separates the light from the darkness. That's one of the first things he does in creation. He makes a distinction between light and darkness. So it's so important to um, realize that God is light. And sometimes when I share the gospel with kids, I use this analogy of a peanut allergy. And I say, God has a sin allergy, right? If someone has a peanut allergy, you cannot be around them, right? You have to separate because there's, there's, a, there's something that, you know, you can't be near God when you have sin. Remember, I used to go to um, school, Christian school, ACS, and they had a peanut-free table. It was like the most sad thing. There was like All four right. people at the table with a big peanut on this little stand with a big X through it. It was just like super, it was a super sad table. Like, it was just like the, it almost was like the leper colony yeah, or something. Yeah, it's like shaming. Yeah, I was like, why do you got to put yeah. the big peanut there? Uh, it was like peanut-free table, like huge. And it was like four kids, and I was like, man, that's just depressing. But... 
I know, you know, if you're peanut free, you know, I'm, I don't mean any. Uh, <laughs> if you're peanut free. Yeah. But, you know, it's just like God, he cannot be around sin. He just can't. He's holy. He's light. And so because God is light, because God is light, darkness cannot be around him, which is a huge problem. Yeah. Right. A huge, huge problem because we're dark. We're sinful. Sin is darkness. Right. And so because of our sin, because of our darkness, God and us are separate. We're separate. Okay. This is before Christ. And so I use the analogy as well that um, it's like God is on a skyscraper and we're on a skyscraper a, a mile away. Let's say, let's say this is God and this is us. And we're a mile away on a skyscraper. We can try to get to God. We can try to get to light by being better. And it's like jumping across. Maybe we'll make it a quarter of the way. Maybe if we do really well, we'll make it, you know, even farther. Maybe if we, you know, do even better, we'll make it even farther. But as far as we jump, there's no way you're jumping across a mile gap. You can't reach it. So God is too holy for us to ever reach the standard because all have sinned and fall short. So the only way to get from you to God is for there to be a bridge that you can walk across. And then you look at what Jesus did on the cross. And what he did was he bridged the gap. You see the cross? He bridged the gap. Mm. And that cross is the bridge that brings sinful man to a holy God because a perfect man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, laid down his life as a sinless offering to make it possible for dark and light to come together because now you become light because of what Christ did. So that's just a simple way to understand the gospel is you can't get to God by your good works. It has to be the cross that bridges that gap. So it says, God is light and in him is no darkness. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So now he's talking about hypocrisy. If we say that we have fellowship with God, so we're saying something, okay? I'm going to church, I'm saying, oh, praise the Lord, brother. God is good, brother. Me and God are so good. My relationship with God's a 10 out of 10. Okay, that's what I'm saying with my words. Oh, I love the Lord. Me and the Lord, yeah, we're great. We're doing good, I, I'm, I'm close to him. But you're walking in darkness, so walking has to do with living. So it's a contradiction of, I'm speaking, I'm in the light, but you're walking in darkness. It says, we lie. Right there is a lie. And we do not practice the truth. So John's coming against people that are claiming to be close to God. But he's saying, hey, if you're not living holy, you can't say that you're in the light. You're lying. You're not practicing the truth. Verse seven. Yeah, it's just there's a strong contrast in there. If you're like a, a pen person between the word lie and truth, right? Yeah. And God being light, and we're walking parapeteo, literally used like where we get the word podiatrist. Mm -hmm. We're literally walking in darkness, right? Yeah. Not literally, figuratively, you know, walking in darkness. But there's strong contrast in there between the light and darkness, lie and truth, right? And there, and John's drawing a stark contrast between the two so like again when it comes to morning meditation i look at that and i go okay is there a really is my line is it blurred or is it gray or is it fuzzy or am i really taking the time to make a strong dichotomy is the word differentiation right between yeah. light and darkness in my life that's right yeah that's right and if i am going to do that then what does that look like today that's right but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So this is a powerful verse. It says, if we walk in the light, as Christ is in the light, now we have fellowship with, most people would think the conclusion would be God, but it actually says with one another. So walking in the light is relating to your fellowship with others. The way that you walk with God is going to, the way that you have that vertical connection and that vertical integrity is going to it's going to give you fellowship with others it's going to affect your fellowship with the body of Christ specifically um, and the blood of his son cleanses us from all sin 
So to me, walking in the light doesn't look like perfection. It looks like honesty before God and before others. Um, to walk in darkness is hypocrisy. We saw that from the previous verse. So to walk in the light doesn't mean you have everything all together. You don't have to be perfect to walk in the light. You have to be confessional and honest. And that's what the community of Christ is for, is for that place where you can confess and be honest about your struggles. And walking in the light is saying if you have a problem and acknowledging that problem, right? I mean, I'd rather, you know, go to a connect group and share that I'm struggling with anger than start praising God and saying I'm great and I have this anger in my heart. Mm. The person that's saying, hey, I'm struggling with anger towards this person, that person's walking in the light. They might still be struggling with the anger. It might not be solved like that. But the fact that they're honest about it, that's, they're still in, they're counted as in the light. The Bible says whoever, um, whoever conceals his sin comes to ruin, but whoever confesses and forsakes his transgressions will obtain mercy. I I think that's how the verse is, but it does talk about to confess and forsake is the one who obtains mercy and not concealing your sin. Uh, David was a man who, you read the Psalms, he's constantly confessing his sin, but he's confessing that to God. He's open and honest with God about his struggle. So we need to be open and honest about our struggles. And that will give us fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from all that that, that sin. So... Can I tell you an interesting take on that? Yeah, yeah. Have I ever told you about that? My thought on forgiveness and the blood of Jesus... Um, so, enough. so it, what's he saying? Because in in my theology, we are already cleansed as believers by the blood of Jesus. So, of course, there's a controversy in First John whether this is written to believers or unbelievers. I'm firmly convinced that it's written to believers to convince them what it means to be in true fellowship with God. So. If we come to Christ, and on the day that we come to Christ, we come to the actualization, the realization that our sins have been forgiven and we are washed and cleansed by the blood of Christ, past, present, and future, Mm -hmm. then why is it saying here that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive them and cleanse us because we're already cleansed, right? Mm -hmm. So my thought on that, this might be interesting. I don't bring it up too much on a Sunday. I don't think it's that controversial, but it certainly is um, different. In, in this, number one, he's talking about that first initial time, that when you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from unrighteousness. But he's also talking late, later after this, if we continue to sin. So there is something in us that does continue to sin, even though we've been cleansed. It's this real interesting paradox in the Christian life, which is you're washed, you're cleansed um, by the blood of Jesus Christ once and for all. But yet that is not a one-off in our practical life. We have to continue to live a life where we're actually denying darkness, malevolence, malicious intentions, and move towards the light. So what I'm saying that John is implying in that verse is that as we walk in the light, because God is light, and as we walk in that light of Him, what happens is, is, is that the blood of Jesus Christ is we're continually getting the affect uh, of it, okay. the affectation, because because we're already forgiven, but we don't walk in our forgiveness. Yeah. We don't actually apply that forgiveness. It's not actuated in our life in the way that I forgive other people, love other people, yeah. show compassion. But when I walk in the light with Christ, parapateo, as I walk around in the light, as Christ is in the light, a couple things happen. One, my, my fellowship, my koinonia with other people mm-hmm. becomes exponential. Yeah. And the other is the full flavor of my forgiveness becomes actualized. Yeah. And I'm like a whole new person. That's right. Yeah, yeah I think that's amazing because, um, yeah, the more, the greater awareness of your sin and the more you're bringing those sins to God, the greater you'll know his mercy mm. and feel that cleansing like, you know, the parable in Luke 7 of the woman who's um, breaking the, you know, weeping at Jesus' feet. And it says, um, you know, imagine someone's forgiven $50 versus someone who's forgiven 
you know, $5 million, who's going to be, who's going to show more love? Yeah. Obviously the person forgiven of $5 million because, um, you know, the person that's sees their need for forgiveness and Christ is going to have more love for God, more grace. They're going to experience God's love more. That's why it's important. Confession is not a bad word. It's not a, um, you know, it's not a bad thing. It's actually a beautiful, amazing thing that Christ wants us to do. In fact, every time we pray in the Lord's Prayer, this the Lord's Prayer is a model for what our prayer life should look like. <clears throat> and one of the emphasis, the things that Jesus emphasizes is forgive us our sins, right? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So we should be constantly asking Jesus to <laughs> forgive us for our sins. And it's like, wait, I've already been forgiven. Yeah, but I need a fresh experience of that for what I did today. Um, just last night, I was having to confess some stuff to the Lord uh, before bed that um, I got, you know, I, I didn't act the way that God wanted me to in a, in a certain scenario, and I had to confess that. So, uh, can you take over for a second? I got to blow my nose. Yes. So I'll pick up and let me see where we are. Got it. Can someone tell me? Because I was trying to correspond with you guys and I actually lost our place. Help me, somebody. Till Jesse comes back. How about 1 John 1 8? If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So there's different ways that we try to handle our sinfulness, right? Uh, one of those ways is is by by confession and repentance and walking in the light of Christ. That's wonderful. That's beautiful. That's biblical. Another way that we actually try to deal with the sinfulness within us is to actually just deny it, just to say it doesn't exist. We do this with sin. Um, you know, I see Ch Chuck Kazmarski on 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 live here with us. We do that in trauma, right? You would, you're right, Chuck being in medical, EMS, whatever, um, Cindy, um, all, so, so she and too. Like when we experience trauma, one of the ways that we try to deal with the trauma is just by saying it isn't happening. It's not happening. It's one of our sort of psychological default modes is to say that isn't happening. Another thing we do is we just transfer our thoughts to something else and we say it's someone else's problem. I'm talking about if we have, if, if we say we have no sin. Right. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we do is we to handle our sin is just deny it, deny its existence. And yeah. do not. Some people deny sin's existence in the world. Some people say there is no such thing as sin. Everything that you call sin is actually an illusion of the greater reality, yeah. which is the cosmic father of the universe, which is just a bunch of baloney, bunch of baloney. Right. And the other thing people try to do is they try to say, I have no sin. I am the light. The light shines from me. Um, you know, I am a part of the, you know, the universal consciousness, which is bringing light to the world, like all these things. But what we're really doing in all that beautiful, flowery, fluffy lie is we're denying that we have sin. Yeah. And John is trying to say um, that is really dangerous mm -hmm. because the aletheia, the truth, can exist in the midst of the lie. They're mutually exclusive. You know, the dichotomous, that's why we call it uh, duplicitous. When someone lives a life, right, of duplicity, it's when they're trying to actually, like, they're living a life of sin, but they're not actually acknowledging that they're actually steeped in it at the very same time. And John's trying to say to the believer, as he writes this letter to them, just how dangerous that is. Yeah, right? so what verse was that last one? That, that was eight. Okay. And I guess, you know, the, for the morning meditation, just the question is, you know, David says, Psalm 139, right? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there's any hurtful or wicked or sinful way in us and, and lead me in the everlasting way. Psalm 139, like the last verses yeah. of that chapter. So really what we should be doing this morning in this time we're together, we're already at almost 10 of 9. Yeah. What we really should be doing is not in some sort of morbid introspective way and morose contemplations of our soul yeah. but just in an honest realistic way knowing that christ has already dealt with it on the cross we just like jesse said we recognize sin inconsistency with the christ within us and we acknowledge it we confess it and we move on 
the one thing we don't want to do, according to First John one eight, is actually just deny it's even there. Yes. Yeah, and that's why taking communion is very powerful as well, because it's like a symbol of, hey, this is, this is gone. You right. know, you're clean. Right. You're clean. Good. You know, John thirteen talks about how Jesus said, "The one who's bathed doesn't need to wash. Mm -hmm. He's clean, except for his feet." Because when Jesus washed the feet, he said, Peter said, you know, um, wash my feet because what Jesus meant by that analogy, you're already bathed, but you're already clean except for your feet. Jesus meant you're already forgiven of all your sin. You're already justified, which means God sees you as just as if I'd never sinned. You're already justified in his sight, but still our feet get dirty, right? Um, we get stinky souls, right? <laughs> And uh, yeah. we step in the mud sometimes, so we got to clean our feet every day. We got to keep that track record with God, just the same way a marriage. I think a marriage covenant's a good example. Like you're, you're in the covenant of marriage. Like you're gonna stay together, and that's. I mean, we see that not happening. You know, but ideally. Ideally, the marriage covenant is meant to be lifelong, right? And that's how God intended. So that lifelong covenant is a symbol of, hey, you're in relationship with me. But if you're having conflict in your marriage and you're not addressing that, it's going to limit your intimacy. So in order for the marriage to be strong, you gotta, you got to know that you're in covenant, but also you got to take the steps to make things right yeah. um, and confess and forgive each other uh, constantly. So uh, although it's different because we don't have to forgive God, right? <laughs> but God, we need to confess before God and allow him to forgive us. So. Yeah. Um, you want we to finish can, we can up close there? there cuz we could do a whole another session on 9 and 10. Yeah, there's no need to rush. There's, like yeah. I'm looking at what people have put into this correspondence. There is so much richness in what people are saying that like there's just a lot to digest already this morning. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll close out there and pray us out, dad, if you can and Yeah. We can get started with the rest of our day. So Let's do it. Thanks for joining. So, Lord, we just pray that you would, um, we're going to just activate that verse right now and say, Lord, search our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit. And in the midst of that, that we wouldn't feel any shame, but we would actually have confidence to boldly approach your throne to obtain the mercy that we need in this time of need. And we already know we have all the mercy that we could ever ask because you are the father of mercies. You are the God of all comfort. So we come to you thanking you for the mercy and the comfort and the confidence that we have that we are forgiven. And we pray, Lord, that we would take the steps towards the light today in whatever darkness we might be in, whether it's, uh, whether it's strain and tension in our family or in our marriages, in our relationships, tension in the workplace, interpersonal tension, like even within our own souls, we're just conflicted within ourselves. We pray that you would give us through the power of your Holy Spirit and through the resurrection power of Christ, we would walk out of the darkness, stop living a lie, and walk in the truth. For whatever that means, for as many of us are in the hearing of this message and in the hearing of this sacred word from the Apostle John right here today by your Holy Spirit. Make it real so that we shine your light brighter than ever before as we walk in that light and we experience the full flavor of our forgiveness and we have this just beautiful fellowship with one another. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So thanks again for joining us. We just always want to mention where we are on Sunday. Coastal Christian meets at 2577 Tilton Road in EHT, and we're meeting at 930. If you didn't hear the message last Sunday, um, I just encourage you to like just go back on the Facebook a couple links, and you'll probably see it right in there. A lot of people seem really blessed by that particular verse in the scriptures that says all of God's promises are yea and in him amen to the glory of God and we kind of like really tease that out as they say to like look at what was really being said there and how um, effectual that can be in our lives and um, so I would love for you to see it if you didn't or pass it along to someone and invite them to be with us at Coastal Christian at 9 30 on Sunday mornings and uh, we will see you there. If you're not able to make it, Jesse and I, if the Lord wills, we'll be back here tomorrow again at 8.15, and we'll pick up somewhere in verses 9 and 10, and hopefully get blessed again by the Word of God. 
All right, so God bless you guys. Have a great day. Um, look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 815. Or when it comes to Coastal Christian, we look forward to seeing you there. there.